historicism is the belief that was held by the majority of the Protestant reformers, including Martin Luther, John Calvin, Thomas Cranmer, and John Knox. Meanwhile, the Catholic Church tried to counter it with an alternate view, such as that put forward by the Jesuit Francisco Ribera during its counter-reformation. This alternate view served to bolster the Catholic Church position against Protestant criticism and as a Catholic defense against the historicist view, which identifies the Roman Church as a persecuting apostasy and the papacy as the seat of the Antichrist. Presently, most of the evangelical and Christian world believe some version of the futurist Catholic Counter-Reformation view of prophecy. The historicist interpretation reveals the entire course of history of the Church from the close of the first century to the end of time, which must necessarily be revised as new events and figures emerge on the world scene. This series is an up-to-date outline of the historicist view of the Revelation. View of the Infant Church, the Seven Churches of Asia Minor, A.D. 96. What is the Church? Where was the Church of England before Luther? Where was the Church in the Middle Ages? These are the sort of questions by which some may be perplexed, and for want of a little knowledge of the history of former times, may be silenced. I propose, therefore, to give a course of lectures on church history, connecting it with the prophecies of St. John in the book of Revelation, and so with early Roman history. I begin from the Apostles' time and hope to outline the principal events, such at least as may suit my purpose, down to the present day. One object I wish to bear especially in view, to prove that the Reformation in England was not a schism that popery was not the first religion of England, but rather a system forced upon her, grafted on to our ancient apostolic church, and only pruned away by the reformers. Would that not a fiber of doubtful origin had been left. In the Acts of the Apostles, we have the history of the churches which they founded, as Rome, Corinth, Ephesus, Galatia, Colossae, etc. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. The churches were congregations of faithful men gathered together, whether in public buildings, in the open air, or in private houses. Amongst these, the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper were faithfully administered, and men ordained as pastors, bishops, elders, and deacons. To these ordinations, various allusions are made in the epistles. Mention is also made of several persecutions of the infant church raised by pagans, and of errors which early infected the congregations. It was during one of these early persecutions that St. John, the only surviving apostle, was banished by Domitian, the reigning Roman emperor, to Patmos an island in the archipelago, now called Patino. There it pleased God to reveal to him the future destinies of the church in a series of visions. This series is called the Apocalypse or Revelation. It is upon these visions I propose to comment. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1 The Revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God, and of the testimony of Jesus Christ, and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace, from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, 
and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be the glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother, and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God, and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice, as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them, which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works, and tribulation, and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, 
that ye may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. And unto the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he, which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where in Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest of Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come, and he that overcometh, and keepeth my works unto the end, to him I will give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessel of a potter shall they be broken into shivers, even as I have received of my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God, and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest, and are dead. Be watchful, and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches and unto the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he 
that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem which cometh down out of heaven from God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot, I would, thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich, and am increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door, and knock. If any man hear my voice, and open the door, I will come into him, and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. St. John opens with a passage from his own history, and designates himself as the writer of this book, as if he said, I, John, who was the companion of the Lord Jesus, who heard his words, saw his miracles, was witness of his transfiguration, shared in his privations, and beheld his sufferings. I, who leaned on his breast at the Last Supper, stood by his cross of agony, received from him the legacy of his afflicted mother, heard his parting word and dying groan, I who saw him at the grave, and conversed with him after his resurrection, I who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that I saw, I have again seen him, and declare unto you from him that blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things that are written herein. I, John, who also am now become your brother and companion in tribulation, was in the isle called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Sixty years had well nigh run their course since this beloved disciple had seen at the Mount of Olives a cloud received the Lord from the sight of his disciples. Since he and they heard the angelic question, Why stand ye here gazing up to heaven? And heard the promise, That same Jesus, whom ye saw go into heaven, shall so come in like manner from heaven. Year by year, they and the church 
looked and longed for the accomplishment of this promise. Other prophecies had been fulfilled, those especially which related to Jerusalem. The Jews had neglected every warning. In vain, there were great sights seen and earthquakes felt, famine and pestilence doing their work, wars and rumors of wars desolating their country, false Christs, wonders in heaven above, and signs on the earth below, signs even in the sanctuary, if to force on them consideration of the prophecies to them. Even just after Paul in the epistle to the Hebrews and James in his epistle had sent a last remonstrance to them, the war began, then the siege, and with it those horrors foretold by the Savior. The Christians suffered not, following the plain command, when they saw the abomination that was to make desolate, spoken of by Daniel, with the Roman army's approach, they fled, and so escaped destruction. The history of the siege is given by Josephus, himself a Jew, and authenticated by the emperors Vespasian and Titus. The memorial of its truth is still standing at Rome, namely the Arch of Titus, on which is sculpted the Table of Showbread, the Book of the Law, and the Seven-Branched Candlestick. This told, and tells at Rome, the story of the conquest. But where was Jerusalem's temple? Not a vestige to give response. Where the beautiful city, its towers and fortresses, desolate and destroyed? Blood-stained ruins and rubbish alone remain. What then had taken Jerusalem's place? What the place of her altar and her temple? It has been said by Jesus, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed, which is indeed the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches. From a small and despised beginning, a better dispensation had been striking its roots far and wide with a temple whose worship is spiritual and whose high priest and sacrifice is Christ himself, the Lamb of God, whose members are God's elect, children of grace, gathered by degrees out of the world, now perhaps despised, persecuted and scattered, but at the appointed time to form a company, a glorious body, some to come with their Lord, some to meet him at his coming. Mighty were the efforts made by Satan to stop the progress of this religion, but in vain. Persecution hindered it not. The blood of the martyrs proved the seat of the church, and however severely treated, the cause seemed still to strengthen. Let us observe what was the state of this increasing body, when from the rocky summit of his island prison, the apostle, with a mixture of joy, sorrow, and anxiety, had looked around on the coast of Asia, and then on the shores of Thrace and Greece, with their gulfs, their islands, and their bays. His eye would rest on the sites of Christian churches, first those of Asia Minor, where Timothy had labored and fallen asleep and the faithful Antipas had been martyred, and where Polycarp still lived a witness for Christ, these under St. John's own superintendence, then the Macedonian and Greek churches of Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, and Corinth. He knew that in the far west on the one side, and on the south and east toward the other, there arose from Christian congregations the incense of prayer and praise to the Lamb of God. There was a little band gathered fondly round the ruins of Jerusalem, where the aged Simeon presided, one at Antioch with its faithful bishop Ignatius. There were the churches of Alexandria and Egypt, founded by St. Mark of Cyprus, where labored Barnabas and that of the Crete, set in order by Titus. 
His mind's eye would catch the break of light in Spain, Gaul, and in our own islands, even the British group. It would turn to Rome, that church where Paul and many others had sealed their testimony by martyrdom, and where the leaven had reached even to the palace of royalty, for some of the household, and even of Caesar's relatives, had there professed the Christian faith. Clement, whose name St. Paul mentions as in the Book of Life, fearless of persecution, presided over its church. Another Clement, cousin to the emperor, had just been executed for conscience sake, and his wife, Domitia, in a desolate island now endured exile. Persecution, however, was not the worst enemy the apostle knew to be at work to injure the rising church. Corruption had begun within. Some had erred from the faith, and false tradition had been mixed with the pure word of God. The Gnostics, a sect of whom one division denied the humanity, another the divinity of Jesus, had sprung up like a noxious weed in the congregations. And in one way or another, Christ Jesus had been superseded in his character of man's only mediator, atonement, and righteousness. The enemy had already largely sowed the terrors among the wheat. St. John knew that one notable enemy would arise, mentioned by St. Paul in his epistle to the Thessalonians, as the man of sin to be revealed. St. John calls him Antichrist. I say notable because his profession was unlike that of other impostors, who said, I am Christ. The word Antichrist is a word expressing a vice Christ, indeed made to express it, one who, acting as a usurper in the professing church, would in effect supersede Jesus Christ in it. Such, in some sort, was the nature of the Gnostic heresy, for its chief professors, while confessing Jesus Christ openly, practically set him aside, declaring themselves to be the wisdom, power, and salvation of God. St. John's first epistle is directed mainly against these erroneous views. This dreaded Antichrist was evidently the same power foretold by Daniel as the little horn of the fourth beast, or Roman Empire, and which was to be the great enemy of Christ and his saints. This little horn was to rise not till after the empire's division into ten, whence it was well understood in the church that till this empire was divided, the reign of Antichrist would not be developed. Nor indeed, notwithstanding Rome's apparent glory, were symptoms wanting which to a discerning eye might seem to indicate the possibility of Rome's fall or disruption being not so very distant. The population were alienated from their rulers, being disgusted with their tyranny, vice, and folly. Fierce barbarian hordes, especially those at the north of the empire, were hovering on the frontiers, and had more than once shown their power by defeating the Roman legions. From this view we may suppose that the holy apostle retired with joy, anxiety, and grief, joy that the Savior's church was extending, sorrow that the seed was sown within it, which might after a while issue in the apostasy of the Antichrist, and anxiety to know how long the time should be till the kingdom of the Lord he loved should be established. We doubt not earnest prayer would mingle with his meditations not infrequently. The Redeemer had given his promise, I will send my spirit, and he will show you things to come. So would the exiled prophet plead the promise, and in answer to such prayer, and in fulfillment of such promise, may we not believe that the revelation was given. I was in the spirit, he writes, on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a great voice saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. It was the voice of Jesus, and he gave this injunction, Write the things which are, and the things which are to happen after them. 
These things were then written to be read, and the blessing was pronounced beforehand. Blessed are they that read the words of the book of this prophecy. St. John seems to have been then abstracted from all that was around him, and though himself in the Isle of Patmos, the scenery he describes is Jewish. He sees a temple, and the interior of it is open to his view. There are seven lamps burning. Jesus Christ, habited like the high priest, though with marks of divinity attaching to him, overseeing all. These lamps are explained to be emblematic of the seven churches then in Asia Minor. And throughout the Revelation, we shall find Jewish scenery and emblems, all familiar to St. John as a Jew, used to show forth the Christian church. The seven stars are said to be the angels or chief pastors of the churches. It is well to mark these emblems, as again and again they occur throughout the book we are about to study. It is not my intention to enter upon the practical lessons that may be derived from the exhortations to these churches, if personally applied, and which would furnish rules for living and dying applicable to the children of God to the end of time. The warnings and encouragements being as signposts to keep each in the right way on his pilgrimage kingdom bound, and the object held forth that we shall, if we overcome, inherit all things and dwell in the temple of God, to go no more out. However useful and pleasant this, my present purpose is to follow St. John and to show what the things were then existing before proceeding to show what was to follow. These churches, I imagine, were specimens of the whole state of the religious society and practice then in existence, with the mixture of good and evil, tares and wheat, the budding of that evil which St. Paul had stated would go on working until it ended in general apostasy. The promoter of all this mischief, hidden and subtle, and indiscernible on earth, is shown to be the devil. He is described with his mimic synagogue of Satan as at work to injure the growing good. He is designated as the instigator of persecution. Behold, Satan shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried. Again he is called the devil, the old serpent, and Satan, which deceiveth the nations. And in the same chapter, the accuser of the brethren. It is only a repetition of the power attributed to him in other scriptures. The father of lies, the roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, a murderer from the beginning, the enemy that soweth terrors. Moreover, he remains in his enmity unchanged, and had six thousand years of experience in his dealings with man to increase his devilish wisdom. Who could withstand him? if it were not for power stronger than his, and that the power of an almighty, all-seeing, ever-present God. St. John shows in his epistles that an antagonistic power would finally conquer him. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. The Call He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches shows us that the instructions and warnings given to them were to apply to all that should ever after read or hear them. The distant blessing pronounced on those that hear and keep the words of this prophecy or teachings show that it is our duty to study and diligently lay them to heart, both for encouragement and warning. There is a very marked connection between the promises to the seven churches and the blessings described as belonging to the saints in the New Jerusalem at the close of the Revelation. Thus to the faithful ones in the Ephesian church it was promised, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God while in the description of the New Jerusalem it is said, on either side of the river was there the tree of life, and 
Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life. To the conquerors in the church of Smyrna, he that overcometh shall not be hurt by the second death. A promise corresponded to that. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. To the victorious at Sardis it was said, They shall walk with me in white, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, the former of which was seen by St. John as fulfilled when he beheld the multitude clothed in white, with palms of victory in their hands. And again it is mentioned at the end of the revelation when the bride, the Lamb's wife, was given to be arrayed in white, which white robe is the righteousness of the saints. The latter refers to those whose names will be found written in the Book of Life at the last and final judgment. A similar correspondence exists with regard to the promise to the Laodicean church, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, and that to the millennium. They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Thus he that gave the promise at the beginning gives the picture of its realization at the end. How consolatory to those who are struggling forward, engaged in withstanding publicly the inroads of evil in the church and in spreading abroad the gospel, or having to bear in private the scorn and persecution of the cross. Often unseen, save in the narrow sphere of daily life, contending against inbred corruptions of the heart, and endeavoring to bring the thought into subjection to the obedience of Christ. How consolatory, I say, to know that the victory will assuredly be given, and that the final end will be blessedness. And so the scene passed away, the messages were sent, and reached the ears of thousands, a message in each case direct from God, and sent to each church by the appointed minister, God thus recognizing the ministerial order and office. And what may have been the effect? Probably that which every faithful minister finds to be his experience in the congregation where he delivers his message. Some believe the things that were spoken, and some believe not. Eighteen hundred years have gone since then. We have the list of warnings and promises, but where are those to whom they were first sent? And where will those be to whom we now reiterate them?